no, they probably need to try and position it on at the back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, I, I can hear me coming from the back. Okay, morning, just. Right, we're going to talk today about using software RAID in Linux and some of the joys and pains associated with it. Uh, how many people here predominantly use hardware RAID in their day-to-day -day business? How many of you predominantly use software RAID of some form? How many of you don't realize you're using software RAID because you're actually using one of those uh, RAID controllers that's pretending to be hardware RAID, but it's actually all done in software? It's a real shame. LSI is really bad at this. They put out loads of controllers that have similar names. Some are real hardware RAID controllers. Some use the device mapper RAID support. So at the end of the day, you may as well be using Linux software RAID because if there is an issue, it's just a lot easier to troubleshoot. Hardware RAID, I do like it on large scale uh, rack environments, but I've had so many controller issues over the years. I've had things where uh, RAID controllers suddenly decided to remove all of its metadata from the disks. Uh, a reboot, it did actually manage to find and recreate the RAID array without reinitializing the array but it was a little worrying at times. Uh, one of the worst I've ever seen was actually a hardware RAID controller where we had a warning from the hardware vendor that the uh, firmware we were using had a potential to reinitialize your array. Please upgrade. So we did. And it reinitialized the array. Um, I, do that, so I like software RAID because I can see what's going on. But, so, but why use MDADM? It's low cost, simple solution. And the fact is, it's hardware neutral. You can have any type of control. It could be SCSI, ID, SATA, SAS. In any type of disk, you can mix and match them. And it's portable. If your machine goes down, you don't have to worry about whether or not you've got the right RAID controller in your other piece of hardware. Just move the disks over. Performance, especially in the RAID 1 space, is usually more than adequate for day-to-day -day use on a modern system. We've often got CPU cycles spare. But we have this ongoing need for storage. Believe it or not, I actually worked somewhere where the PA regularly dragged and dropped her C drive onto the server as a backup. You know, and she kept multiple copies. We wondered why we were running out of storage. So go forth, find storage. I'd love to find some big storage. This is what I'd love to put in, but sadly my budget in this particular case was more like this. So the environment we're looking at is just a simple SMB server. We've maxed it out. It's a relatively common motherboard. We've used all the IDE ports. We've even put in an extra IDE controller. It's not worth putting in more IDE disk. Price point shifted now. For the cost of buying two SATA disks, we save enough to put in a SATA controller. Put in a four port SATA controller. Use a well-known common brand. Put in a four port so we've got some room in the future. A couple of nice terabyte well-known hard drives and do a few checks first to make sure they've got none of the problems that Seagate have had recently. Do a little bit of testing, though, as per most environments, we don't actually have a complete match for a production server. So different motherboard, slightly different version of Linux, but it's just enough at the moment to do a sanity check that the hardware is safe, sound, before we expose our business to it. So. First thing I'll do, I'm a little bit paranoid. I've had a considerable number of hardware failures in, in the disk space over the years as I'll run a series of smart checks on any new disks. Again, another reason I like software RAID. A lot of the big hardware RAID controllers, you don't actually get to see the physical disk in any form. Actually makes it quite hard to, to do any smart level monitoring. Yes, there's some stats from Google that say how much value is there in that monitoring, but it, it, it's nice sometimes just to do a long check to make sure it drives behaving properly. Next step, we'll set up our RAID. Now, how many of you ever do software RAID partitionless? You're mad. I'm sorry. Just it hurts. put a single partition in. It's not really using up much disk. Put it type FD. It really helps when you have to move this disk somewhere else for it to realize that it's software RAID. And then the tools will tend to automatically find and set up that software RAID configuration. 
fairly standard MDADM command here. Create a RAID one, two devices, SDA B1. One, I'm doing this now currently on the test rig, but I'm actually specifying MD3 because that's the slot I know it's going to end up adopting on the production server. So I specify it in advance. Therefore, the on-disk metadata is already aligned with the mount point it's going to have on the production server. So we migrate some of the production data onto this, uh, the fairly static data that we know uh, isn't going to be changed between now and when we move the disks over and we do a little bit of stress testing before the go live. So we move our disk into production server, confirm there's no issues with our RAID set. Ray, we're all good to go, but the old volumes I don't reuse immediately. I just unmark them so no one can really see them in case we do have any issues. Because of course we do. It's not a good day. The, the users are reporting that some of the files they're saving to the server are coming back slightly different from what they started. This is not good. This isn't a happy place. So, Have you tried, tried to log on again? again? Yeah, sorry, that's a little bit loud. But yep, yeah, first thing to do, the obvious. No, it's still broken. So we check the file system. Notionally looks okay. FS check is, is okay. We do a smart check. Now we're early on the production hardware again. No major issues. But boss isn't happy. We pull the disks out of the production server, revert the old volumes, and go and do some more testing. But we can't reproduce the problem on our test hardware. Oh, maybe it's the version of Linux. Maybe it's a hardware issue. What, what's, what's the combination here? Maybe it's just a float. So we move everything back to production. We don't allow users to see the storage so they can carry on doing some work, but the disks are live in the pod server. It's still not a good day. We're still having problems. We're still seeing the data corruption. So we're going to go in a little bit deeper. So I create a bunch of dummy test files on the disk and run MD5 sums on them. And just leave for loop running, running MD5 checks. And sometimes they match and sometimes they don't. In fact, I was actually seeing three levels of variance on the MD5 checks. This isn't healthy. So somewhere between the data going to disk, we're getting differences between the two halves of the RAID 1 set that's then being read back uh, based on um, the access method from different points. So we do a quick check. Is the system happy with the RAID set? So most of you who've used software RAID will know, do a quick check on PROC MD stat. Looks OK. Notionally, both disks are aft active, it's not showing anything obvious, so now we've got to dig a little deeper. Um, software RAIDs exposes an extended sys file system now that allows you to dig a little bit deeper when you've got problems. So one of the first things you do is force the RAID set to perform a check on itself. This is going to take a while. Um, especially if it's a terabytes worth of RAID 1. Uh, have fun if you're doing it with 4 terabytes worth of RAID 5 or greater. Be prepared to go home for the weekend. It does take quite a while. So we get this mismatch count value. Monitor it. A good way of doing it is just use watch on it. But our check's finished. We check the value. That's awfully high. That should be zero. There's a the, the two disks have basically got out of sync. So we try to fix it. This is the repair command it will go through and make sure these two disks are aligned. It takes about as long as the check. Be prepared to just wait a long time. So we've gone through, we've done that. The FS checked the file system, it's got a little bit garbage, so we resync some data. Everything's looking okay. I'm a bit weary about rerunning check again because I don't want to wait another 240 minutes. I set up some dummy files, I run my checksums again, and surprise, surprise, we still got data corruption going on. Uh, no. So let's reduce the problem. What we're actually dealing with here is not just a vanilla file server. There's a few layers involved. We've got three types of storage controller under the hood, the onboard IDE, 
a third-party IDE controller, SATA controller. We're actually running a uh, RHEL 5 based Zen DOM0. It's accessing the storage courtesy of Software RAID plus LVM in the way. Then over the top, we've got a whole series of virtual machines. So there's a lot of levels where we may actually be having a problem. Is it a bug in the version of the Zen kernel we're running? Is it an issue actually in the VM that we're running? So let's reduce the kernel, reduce the problem down so we end up with a vanilla Enterprise 5.3 kernel. Even remove that LVM from the problem space, keep it really, really simple, and just check, do we still have the problem? Yes, we do. Time to dig a little deeper, I'm afraid. So we go to the obvious sources, kernel mailing list, the Linux SATA drivers, the RAID mailing list, and also have a dig around looking at possible issues with Western Digital hard drives. Now, we're using a relatively common uh, SATA controller. It's a well-known chipset. It has had reported issues in the past on the kernel mailing lists, but most of them should be resolved in the, the, the enterprise kernel that we're running here, so it should be good. Nothing too obvious. Um, Western Digital hardware, driver, hardware mailing lists and a couple of the forums produce something quite interesting. Anyone heard of time-limited error recovery? If you ever play with a combination of enterprise and non-enterprise disk, it's something you need to be aware of. A lot of non-enterprise disk, if there's a bad block, can go away for a long time to try and find you a safe block to be reallocated. If you're using that in a RAID set, there's a chance, especially where it's a hardware RAID controller, that the RAID controller will suddenly mark that disk offline and fail part of the RAID set. Your enterprise disks, the usually ones marked RAID on the hardware manufacturer's website, actually have this uh, facility time-limited error recovery enabled. You can enable it on the cheaper disks. Do it at your own risk. If, you wanna, if you're playing with some Western Digital disks and you've got this problem, simply Google for TLER, Western Digital. You may find a link to somewhere on RapidShare where you can get this. Western Digital don't like providing it because then they've got a price differential, and it's quite a serious one. So find it, it's a DOS disk, reboot the system, patch the BIOS on the uh, hard drive so that they've got TLR enabled. I'm not really surprised. Uh, I am surprised right now because my computer's just decided to go to sleep. Anyone work on power management under Linux and know why certain hard drives decide after suspend that they will go to sleep a lot? Anyway, the screen will hopefully start working again in a moment if not, I've got this on the USB stick. Unsurprisingly, it didn't fix anything. That wasn't the, the real reason for the to do a reboot here. Yeah, I've got a reboot going on. Okay, we'll bring that back up. Explain again while we're waiting with why the pros and cons of that feature that Western Digital have. And is it on other vendors? Oh, the, the TLER feature. Okay. Um, most, most hardware vendors like Seagate, Western Digital in particular, when you look at their uh, SATA drives or SAS drives, 
Uh, usually these things are always enabled on any SaaS models, but within their normal uh, SATA disk space, you'll see that their enterprise drives usually will state things like RAID ready, whereas the consumer drives they won't. Western Digital differentiates by actually having a class slightly below their enterprise drives that they class as consumer RAID ready. And the fact is they have this faster recovery. So what they'll do is if they can't recover within I can't remember the time, for a certain period of time, then they will mark the block as failed and return back to the controller uh, rather than taking a long time just to find a block that they can actually transparently reuse. Because the way most disks work is they'll have a pool of available blocks that they haven't already passed out to the file system so that if any blocks start failing, they start reallocating blocks transparently that you don't see anything. And eventually, with a lot of hard drives, one reason they do fail on you is that they've actually allocated all those spare blocks and have none available anymore. So just watch for it. Um, it tends to be more of an issue on the hardware RAID controllers because you can't see what's going on. It's managing it all for you. So under the hood, you've got no idea that the, the disk went off to try and remap this. Under software RAID, you've got a little bit more visibility. Uh, does the smart monitoring show up, uh, the fact that it's reallocating blocks? Uh, yes, if you do um, uh, smart CTL uh, minus A on the hard drive, and with certain controllers, you might want to do minus D ATA to specify that it's a you might want to do minus D ATA to say it's a uh, use ATA based mappings because often when it sees it's a SCSI device, it doesn't talk to it properly or vary depending on your distro. But that will come back and there's one of the tables there. You can get it with just that table with minus uppercase A, and it tells you things about um, reallocated blocks, hard drive temperature, uh, and um, how close it basically is to failing. Though you really need to look at the uh, smart tools um, guides because certain dry hard drive manufacturers report some of those values in an erratic fashion. So it's not unusual in the case of Seagate, there's one value that typically would indicate that your drive is about to completely die. But in the case of Seagate disks, it just constantly increases <laughs> over time. So you just have to take that value as a pinch of salt, which is a real shame. Just one more question before you start again. With the uh, time limited error recovery thing, wouldn't the quote worst case scenario be that the disk would simply drop offline? You wouldn't normally expect to see corruption because of that. Um, yeah, that, that's quite right. Um, the worry I had, one reason, I mean, A, I wanted to just remove it from the possible reasons in this particular case anyway. But. And we're back there. Um, yeah, we wanted just to remove it as a, a possible reason for the, the problem to begin with. But the fact was, while it's off doing that, if while you're doing that, you're running the checksum, and then it, it, it's popping in and out of this mode because it can happen quite quickly or slowly. You know, it, it, when it's looking for a block to replace, it may come back quite quickly or it may take a long time. And you just couldn't be sure what was going on. So it was a bit of a red herring in the end, and in the case of this, I wasn't surprised. It wasn't a shock, the fact that this wasn't the real reason why we had a problem. And we've gone through now, and one thing to bear in mind if you're really troubleshooting software rate is dig down in that sys file system it provides. It provides an awful lot of feedback, that some of which isn't that well documented. The Linux Foundation site that now holds the Linux RAID documentation is getting a lot better 
But when I started all of this, some of the, the dots out there were minimal at best. So we've gone through, we've looked at the drivers, they seem to be okay. It doesn't seem to be specific to the SATA um, controller we're using, but let's just double check that we don't have any hardware conflicts. So this is our original hardware, our original platform, this is where we were. So we went through, we checked the firmware on the system board, the firmware on all of the controllers to make sure it wasn't a controller-controller issue. You know, it's the fact that we've got a um, silicon image IDE controller and a SATA controller. Is there an issue there? At one point, we even pulled the silicon image controller out, and we, the, the IDE controller out, and we ran with the SATA controller. We're still seeing the corruption. So we went back to our test hardware, which at the time was Ubuntu 8.10. It's a slightly different motherboard family and, and everything else. Yeah, great, different test environment. We even tried putting a new hard drive in with the same clean baseline version of Red Hat Enterprise. We never saw it go wrong. So at this point, we're really suspecting we've got a hardware conflict. So we went away then and said, okay, what are the motherboards have we got around that we can try this out on? So we completely transferred all the disks from the server into a new case with the same IDE PCI controller, same SATA controller, different onboard IDE, same software stack, no issues, ran solidly for two weeks without a single blip, single problem, not a single piece of data corruption. Had jobs running in the background, just regularly generating files, running checksums, and alerting me if there's any problems. Not a blip. So our final solution in the end was we chose a motherboard that we had plenty of, therefore we could always ha build an equivalent system, which was the NVIDIA class board. We actually ended up dropping the SATA controller because we didn't need it because the board had an onboard starter controller. But it actually works either way. And in the future, we're actually going to put that starter controller back in because we fully expect we're going to need to put eight starter disks in in the future, not just the two terabyte disks we've got in that box at the moment. So finally, we've been through all of this. We know how to, to analyze um, MDADM in the future. And oh, the relief. We're so happy. And the team at work can finally celebrate. Yay, it's all gone live. <laughs> what did we learn? Well, some hardware really sucks. Uh, I know a lot of people have said just how bad VM motherboards can be. And I've used a lot of them over the years, but I've never seen a problem this bad. We've since then tried that SATA controller in a VIA-based desktop motherboard uh, to give someone some extra storage on the desktop. And we had exactly the same problems even though it was a different family of VIA chipset. I haven't seen any references or people uh, on mailing lists suggesting this problem, but I've got it with two completely different VIA motherboards and two completely different hardware manufacturers. <laughs> we definitely learn patience. All of these RAID checks take time. Uh, the, this particular box, the RAID 5 set that's in it, if it goes down, it's down for 12 hours while it runs a full check on that RAID set. Uh, and that's at the RAID level without involving FS check and everything else. Other things, virtualization rocks, because at the end of the day, when we move this hardware around between different motherboards, and the actual server environments uh, that we're providing to the business, no one noticed because that they were um, basically in a hardware agnostic environment. The only thing that needed tweaking a couple of times was the init RD for the base virtualization environment just to make sure it had all the right drivers in for the, the baseline environment, for the, sorry, for the new hardware. And we definitely made sure in future we've got a better test environment so we can avoid hitting some of these things again. If you want some background on TLER, that's one of the main threads I saw discussing it. There's a great thread on one of the Debian mailing lists about debugging RAID. Uh, a lot of the Red Linux RAID stuff's now moved into the Linux Foundation's website. Uh, help them make it better, because there's still quite a few gaps. And digging around in the Linux RAID mailing list, if you're doing a lot of it, it's worth having uh, a subscription just to keep an eye on things that are going on there. So, any other questions? I've only probably got a time for one it is lunchtime now, so if you want to go rush off to lunch, that's fine. 
Um, we're back at 1.30, and if you want to stay and ask, ask a few questions, that's fine too. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, the talk will be on the website. I'll be passing it over to Simon. Have you looked at ButterFS and the built-in rate support? And Not the fact that it does checksumming, so if one of your mirrors failed, it would notice yeah. and immediately fall back to the other one yeah. and such things. Uh, another option in this case, something that would have actually caught the problem sooner, was if we'd actually been running XFS on the RAID file system because of some of the checksumming it does on reads and writes. So um, it would have actually thrown up a whole bunch of errors quite early on. Um, Partway through this, we actually put a test volume in with XFS and it just went completely crazy, it just didn't like working on the uh, base environment. So XFS does rock in that respect. Uh, yeah, when things like butter uh, mature, definitely something on our agenda. Okay, so what's wrong with uh, having no partition table on the, on the disk? Uh, no, you, what's wrong with not having a partition table? Yes. Uh, if you start moving these disks around between different, it's not so bad now with modern flavors of Linux, but um, typically if you go and put in a rescue disk or a live CD, it seems to be uh, more likely it will auto discover your RAID file system if it's actually put within a partition on the disk with the right partition type. I've had occasions where trying to recover an older box where they've done um, RAID 1 root file system with no partition table and then partition the uh, RAID file system. So the boot is within the RAID one. Uh, that we had some fun in game trying to recover. Yeah. yeah, you, at any point when you were trying to discover what was causing the corruption, did you try actually just writing to the disks, uh, removing um, the RAID, software RAID entirely and try writing directly to the disks? Um, yeah. Um, Did you have the problem then? No, which was really weird. Ah. Okay. <laughs> that that was what hard. was really weird. But what we should have tried, which I've realized in retrospect we didn't do, is we should have tried a simultaneous write to both disks. But it's hard there to do with the timings. Um, from my work in the media space, uh, I know of issues in the past with PCI bus timings. And... Um, there was an issue with uh, certain Howpage um, video capture devices where you potentially see data corruption across the PCI bus in certain cases. So that's where we, at the end of the day, that's where I suspect the real problem was, was down at the PCI bus level. Uh, but when we were just doing it with right into one disk or the other disk, everything always behaved. But we did never come up with a sensible way to try and hit both disks simultaneously without having software right there. If you've got a really good way of doing it, let me know. Okay, uh, last question. Anyone? Um, just uh, with the systems that you're testing, how much RAM was in these systems? Because I've had experiences where a machine that has four gig of RAM in it fails, reduce it to two, and it works fine. Oh. Um, a whole variety during the course of this. Uh, the baseline server was originally with about 1.5 gig. Uh, by the time we finished, we'd actually pushed it. Um, during the course of this, We'd actually done memory tests as well, uh, which I didn't include here. We'd just done usual running mem test and swap memory in and out. Uh, the test rig uh, was uh, just running a single two gig stick. When we ran it in the Intel motherboard, we ran it with a pair of one gig sticks. Uh, the final box that everything's in at the moment is currently running with a mix of sticks running two gig, and again, they've all been memory tested. Um, I haven't tried pushing the box up to four it doesn't need it at the moment. Okay, if we can thank the speaker okay. now.